let me know or let Mark know. So I want to follow on from my owner's talk last week um, and fast forward probably some 400 years. Um, and quite a bit of what she talked about follows on in my talk. Well, I think it does anyway. For instance, she talked about peasants having there uh, been a problem on its own, the actual word peasant. Similarly, the section um, of society known as the poor and the working class are not always interchangeable in the 19th, 20th century. When we look at food in this period, uh, we have to consider both wants and needs, which again, which is something that she spoke about. And when we talk about a healthy diet, we can't just think about food. Um, there are many other factors which we have to consider. And she talked about a healthy <coughs> peasant diet. And later I shall discuss research about healthy diets in Victorian Britain. So let's wind it up to the 19th century um, to a slightly less exotic place than where she spoke about Portugal. And I want to look basically uh, at, at uh, research that I've done on Nottingham. <clears throat> so I want to give you, first of all, the historical background. So that's slide two, Mark. Um, the 19th century witnessed uh, great changes in population um, and urban living conditions, predominantly rural populations prior to the 1820s and possibly slightly before that, have been able to survive just um, because they were close to the food production and were in smaller communities with few towns of notable size. Even though this was fine while agriculture prospered, but the period between 1813 and the accession of Victoria saw one of the blackest periods of English farming. The cessation of hostilities in, with France in 1815 saw the prosperity of farming fall dramatically. So following industrialization in the 1820s, greater concentration um, of people were to be found in growing number of large towns and cities, notably Manchester and its surrounds, Bradford, Liverpool, Birmingham, places like that, as well, as obviously, of course, of London. Nevertheless, um, the 1831 census showed that not much more than a third of the population actually lived in towns. <clears throat> Pressure was placed uh, on the surrounding farmland to produce more and more crops and meat to feed these growing urban centres. The growing pressure on space in turn created public health problems that were both novel in form and magnitude. <clears throat> Basically, too many people were living cheap by jowl in cramped conditions with little or no sanitary infrastructure. Poverty and grind were the fuel of material progress. Too many unskilled workers made labor cheap and wages were kept very low as a consequence. So by the end of the day at the markets, where the poor bought the majority of their food, the best food had been taken and all that was left was the wilted vegetables, decaying potatoes, old cheese, rancid bacon, tough meat, which had often come from diseased animals and adulterated food, which magnified the problems facing them, the poor that is. After 1834, with the introduction of the poor law, um, Amendment Act, the poor did have a fallback plan, um, but the workhouse system was designed to keep them just on the right side of starvation without diverting capital from the wage pool. During the latter decades of the 19th century, various inquiries were conducted into the condition of the poor. <clears throat> 
Uh, these included Henry Mayhew's study of the London labour and London poor of 1851, Charles Booth's 1886 life and labour of people uh, and people of London, Benjamin Seabone Roundtree's study of York published in 1901 and the report on physical deterioration of 1904 which was set up after the disastrous findings and results of the Boer War. Most of these reports um, suggested that the poor quality and quantity of food uh, that the poor survived on and how this impacted on their lives generally. <clears throat> Slide three. The availability of food is the next thing that I want to look at. So during the 18th century, improvements have been made in the crops grown uh, and meat reared on farms, the so-called agricultural revolution, which is actually um, questionable these days, whether it was a revolution. Um, the, the farmers were impelled less by altruistic desires, i.e. to feed a growing population, more by the desire for fatter rents and larger profits. Larger areas of land had been put under the plough, um, under Norfolk for rotation, fodder crops, marling, liming, knowledge of animal husbandry, selective breeding, by Robert Bakewell and Coke of Holcomb had improved livestock. This came at a fortuitous time for the growing towns. Improvements took place but were uneven. And much of the improvements, certainly in the animal husbandry, would have not really impacted on the life of the poor, as we will come to in a little while. Transport links um, also improved with the coming of the railway age. Soft fruit from Kent could now be successfully transported to the London markets far quicker uh, and thus keeping it fresh. Um, similarly, vegetables from the surrounding growing areas, Suffolk, Norfolk, Kent, could be harvested and transported into the towns far more easily than by horse and cart. And by the end of the 19th century, milk was transported by rail and arrived in the town still fairly fresh, depending on how it was um, taken from the cow and put into the churns. Um, for instance, in <clears throat> Nottingham or the surroundings of Nottingham, the, um, there's some records of milk being sent twice a day from a place called Wynmapool, which was a village about six miles from Nottingham, by train. Ice was being increasingly used to keep food, especially fish, fresher on its journey from source to buyer. And obviously, as towards the end of the um, 19th century, um, refrigeration started to become more uh, in line rather than just using ice. <clears throat> However, despite the improvements, there was always the opportunity to pass off poor uh, stand, substandard food to unsuspecting customers. And these were found in the outlets um, that where the poor, well, where everybody bought their food. <coughs> Markets were the uh, predominant place to buy food for the poor um, because they got a better deal there. And I'll explain a bit more in a few minutes why. Hawkers and peddlers, commonly known as costermongers, sold everything from their barrow or tray around the town. And Victorian street food was a huge industry. Hot potato sellers were a popular site and later fish and chip sellers, tripe, pigs trotters, hot pies. Hot food was a, quite a, an important part of the food sold within the markets because um, for many of the poor, actually having something to heat their food up with was um, quite difficult. The fixed premises, the shop, the butcher, the baker and the chandler, <clears throat> 
Um, grocers would obviously buy large proportion or large quantities of food and then put it into smaller pieces, packets uh, to process them so that they could be sold. And they also did blending of tea, coffee, <clears throat> etc. But the working class, and more particularly the, the lower end of the working class, the poor, um, tended to um, avoid going into shops because they could get snared into credit or they were sold underweight or overpriced food. The strong possibility was that much of the food was also adulterated. And there are quite a few cartoons from that period from Punch showing the um, adulteration of different foods and how they managed to um, pull the wool over the eyes of the poor person going in there. But as the 19th century progressed, shops actually became more and more prevalent and the poorer housewife began to purchase her shopping from these premises. And for, you know, if you remember places that you have been brought up in and that, there were always lots of little shops, none, none of the big shops that we have today. Um, <clears throat> much of the food bought would be in very small quantities and, um, you know, enough really for each day and uh, in a, a few minutes you'll see a, a diet of somebody um they purchased very usually as well because a lot of it was um people were paid daily rather than weekly um the system of truck was also still very popular in this time. Well, I'd say popular, it wasn't with the, the poor, but it certainly was with the um, the people who own the, the looms or whatever. Um, and they could enforce on a lot of the workers to buy food or bread or whatever they wanted from their own, um, from the, the owners. Um, and this came out particularly in the Framework Knitters Enquiry of 1845, which looked into the conditions of the framework knitters. Slide four, five, six, seven, and eight, eventually. <laughs> um, in E.P. Thompson's The Making of the Working Class, he quotes a journeyman cotton spinner who states the diet of spinners chiefly composed of water gruel and broken oat cake and sometimes colored with a little milk together with a few potatoes and a bit of bacon and fat so it, that just is if you like is an introduction to what sort of poor diet that most of the the poor did have <clears throat> i want to look at first of all bread which was a staple food of the poor uh, it was the single most important element of the diet. 80 to 90% of the population um, ate bread, certainly for, if not all meals, for certainly one or two of them each day. Uh, bread riots in Nottingham in the 1800s uh, show how important getting flour to the poor was with um, the justices, magistrates, making sure that there was enough um, flour to be for them to get them to make their own bread. A letter from somebody in um, America in 1855, a letter from Matthew Lancashire, wrote about how important bread was even over there. Uh, the problems with bread included well, what was included in it was the excessive salt, the cheap fat, white fleet wheat flour, which was often bleached with chlorine. There are very few vitamins or minerals within the bread, and inclusion and the inclusion of alum or alum, a toxic chemical to whiten it, and the use also ground bones or lime powders to bulk the flour out. And this was why. Um, for the poor to go in a shop, they could often get duped into buying 
bread or flour with all these um, rather unsavory ingredients. The introduction of the roller mills um, caused a, a bit of a, a problem um, <clears throat> in the mid 1800s. Um, it altered the type of flour for use in bread making and it wasn't always for the better. The lack of fiber basically in the white flour. Yeast had been improved and as a consequence, the fermentation process was reduced. Nevertheless, the standards of bread was very hit and miss before 1914. Nevertheless, this reliance on bread was eventually overtaken by potatoes. And although England didn't suffer the same way as Ireland with the potato famine in 1845, um, the English country labouring population suffered quite dramatically. Um, the potatoes were always referred to as the root of misery and fit only for Irishmen and pigs and were always associated with misery and hardship. Meat was eaten but not every day and once again the standard of meat offered for sale varied greatly. One thing that did change was the tendency to eat reject fat meat um, especially in the urban populations, but not in the rural ones. Introduction of frozen imported meat from North America and then mutton from New Zealand in 1882. Um, but then that later changed, they preferred to get lamb. Meat on the bone, stewed or fried, was the most economical form of meat, uh, which was eked out with offal brains heart, liver, kidneys and pluck, which is lungs and intestines of sheep. And there is a, um, a recipe how to make, uh, how to cook pluck in a few minutes. <clears throat> of the meats that um, the poor ate particularly, pork was perhaps the largest amount, um, and certainly until the First World War because there is an abundant supply of pigs within towns, which caused its own problems. A variety of products could be made from pork, including sausages, polonies, saveloys and brawn, all tasty and all fairly easy to cook, and or they could buy it ready prepared. Pork pies also provide a hot and appetizing meal from a small quantity of meat. Bacon was a favourite among the lower income groups as it kept well and was flavoursome, which was a bonus considering the fairly monotonous bland food that they consume most of the time. Other meats consumed were poultry, game and rabbits. Skinned rabbits from Belgium were known as Ostend cat, where regularly, and they were regularly sold in butchers. Fish. Technical changes in fishing methods facilitated an increase in supply rather than changing the nature of the actual catch. Until the mid 19th century, prime quality fish caught by the line and kept alive until it reached the market. Trawling in the early days caused many problems. Firstly, it suffocated the fish. And secondly, the more unpalatable fish caught was a problem selling Things like coalfish, catfish, dogfish were sold under the name of more acceptable varieties. And again, this shows how the poor could get duped into buying um, less than nice food. The solution lay in presenting the fish in an unrecognizable form and the technique of filleting began. Once again, the time and the skill for preparation was a factor but generally the whole fish was consumed, consumed by the poor. Once again, the introduction of railways and ice helped um, in the fish industry for it to expand. And the marriage of fish and chips in around 1870 produced a very good growing industry. Um, the frying of fish in oil or fat camouflages any decay, and a good deal of fried fish came from the end of the day stocks. <clears throat>
Shellfish was another favourite for the poor. Oysters and mussels, whelks were eaten in large quantities, as were jelly deals. But again, um, as we'll see later on, you know, these sort of things, nowadays we are very squeamish about eating things like that um, because of the, the chances of catching food poisoning. And these things were obviously bred in areas where it wasn't very palatable. So they could cause quite considerable problems for health. Milk had always been included in the diet of families to a greater or lesser extent, but the poor condition of fresh milk uh, made it a real health hazard. Uh, consumption rose, but there's no evidence of the rising milk yield. Um, so we can only assume that other products such as cheese and butter declined or imports of those increased. Much of the milk sold to poorer families would have been over 24 hours old and been kept in conditions less than conducive for its benefits. <clears throat> Towns had their own dairies. But as transport links increased, as I showed you earlier, milk was brought from the surrounding countryside and further afield. And town dairies were starting to decline at the end of the 19th century. From the Tithe Commission of 1847 for um, the parish of St Mary's in Nottingham, it listed um, the number of cow keepers, totaling 86 who between them kept 248 cows. While the parish of um, St. Mary's is not a particularly large area and uh, it would have been quite uh, unpleasant, I would have thought, to have walked around that area with all those cows. One by one, the byproducts of milk was condensed, sorry, <clears throat> one of the byproducts of um, milk was condensed milk used in bakeries and confectionery trades, as well as in cafes and restaurants. It was also used widely by poor families as a substitute for cow's milk to feed infants, but that was often with disastrous results because uh, it was one of the uh, main places where they caught infantile diarrhea from. Butter and cheese were another byproduct of milk, and for the poor, butter was too expensive. Um, so, to substitute their fat intake, they tended to use lard, which obviously came from the pigs. <clears throat> By the end of the 19th century, an alternative fat had been found in the form of oleomargarine, but this was not particularly attractive, both visually and taste wise. And it wasn't until 1887 that the Margarine Act clearly defined the difference between butter and margarine. So again, another area where the poor could get duped. Cheese had been a favourite of the working classes as it added little more interest into their diet, which was fairly monotonous. Cheese making was fairly traditional um, rather than butter, but farms which produced the cheese were often quite away from the main towns and they had to make a product which they could transport quite easily. And much depended obviously on the state of the um, milk as to what sort of cheese came about from it. Um, but by the end of the 19th century, imported factory made cheese from North America, Canada, New Zealand had started to come into the market. Vegetables and fruit, the size and demand um, of the market proximity provided by the growing urbanization of towns was the stimulus for this. Um, as the towns expanded, so growers altered their crops um, and the intensity of production. And often uh, the fact that um, there was a, a, a way of getting um, the remains of uh, privies and middens out into the fields surrounding the towns was often a good um, method of 
producing or increasing the production of fruit and vegetables. Um, in Nottingham, it used to be taken on the Grantham Canal from the Lean Gate um, by canal boat down through um, West Bridgeford, which is a suburb of Nottingham, and it ended up on the field surrounding uh, Gamston, <clears throat> which is about five or six miles from Nottingham. Market for fruit and vegetables was highly seasonal. Potatoes, onions, Jerusalem artichokes, carrots, turnips, watercress, lettuce, peas and beetroot were all eaten throughout the year. The availability of night soil and stable manure was very important, as I've said. Um, fruit didn't start to increase um, until later on in the um, century for uh, obvious reasons. Uh, the perishable nature of it kept prices high, so the poor, again, couldn't afford it. Apples and bananas were apparently two of the growing market in imported fruit. Allotments were encouraged to eke out um, the budget for the poor, although the very poor would have found it quite difficult. They weren't, wouldn't be able to afford to have allotments, and they were usually used by the more skilled workers who, earned, who earned slightly more than um, the poor. Um, slide, oh, if you can do the other slides, Mark, um, and I'll just go through those. There's a couple of, um, the, when I was talking about the bread, there from the one from Nottingham, one from Mansfield, saying that they got to um, allow a certain supply amount of um, uh, corn for the poor. So when things got quite difficult, then uh, the local authorities actually stepped in. And the next one is, yeah, there's the one from for Sheep's Pluck. Um, and that was taken from Charles Francatelli's plain cookery book for the working classes. Apparently he was the uh, chief chef for Queen Victoria, but he wrote this book, obviously wanting people to make nice food for themselves. And the next one. Yeah, there are some diets which I can put up again in a, a little while. Um, the first one is from 1811, and that's sort of shown for a week. Um, the, the next one, again, I think is for about a week. Uh, and again, the third one. But the one at the bottom is for extremely poor uh, family, the budget of a widow with four children. And you can see that on a Saturday night, she buys a couple of potatoes, a bit of bacon, a bit of tea and coffee and things like that. So it's it's quite, um, you know, that they were buying on very small every day. And next one is, I don't know. Yeah, another diet there. As you can see, it's pretty monotonous, pretty boring, not a lot of anything in there. And the next one. Okay. This is, yeah. <clears throat> Consumption within the family. Um, it was very unevenly divided. Men tended to eat a main meal of meat or bacon or fish and potatoes while the women were limited to often to their meals of bread and butter and tea. In many of the surveys undertaken, women and children suffered the, from underfeeding to a much greater extent than men. Accordingly, it was noted that women seemed to have lost the spark of humor or desire. Well, I wonder why. Children more evident evidently affected and the physical deterioration committee of 1904 uh, devoted a considerable section 
of its report to looking at school children who were inadequately fed and were unable to make use of schooling. It's interesting to view this problem with that of today, where many children in deprived areas are unable to ad adequately study because of a lack of essential foods. What was eaten wasn't just about necessity, as Iona said, it was about taste, wants, as well as need. And next one, Mark, please. Slide 10. Okay. If I go now on to adulteration of food, which came under the Adulteration of Food and Drugs Act of 1872. As I've already said, bread, the flour was often bleached with chlorine, alum added. Um, the poor quality of the flour, bones and lime powder were supplemented and also cheap fat. And also part of the problem was the state of the bakeries. Um, they were often underground or below the, uh, the street level. So they were extremely hot with bakers often sweating into the dough, which doesn't bode very good for a nice loaf. <clears throat> Meat was unsound, often sold under cover of dark in the poorer areas. And again, if you look at the um, uh, Nottingham in this period, there are a lot of um, um, butchers and uh, places that were getting rid of meat. And they were all down sort of dark alleys very small um, uh, streets, so uh, they could get away with uh, quite a lot. Um, often the state of the animal before slaughter and the slaughtering itself caused many problems, for instance, TB and cattle. Food were fed, that was fed to pigs, often was, which were going to be slaughtered anyway, were often fed offal and scavenged on other diseased organs of, of animals that had already been um, killed. So in order to uh, cover up disease or contaminated meat, it was made into things like sausages, polonies, pies, or brawn. So much of the meat slaughtered was contaminated or diseased, but there was a strong butcher's union, which kept the standards low. And despite constant struggles by the medical officer of health, um, meat was still of an, quite an unsatisfactory condition well into the 20th century. Fish was highly susceptible to deterioration, as you obviously know, because of a lack of storage and transport in it distances. So they used to fry it to cover up any problems. Milk, storage and conditions, cattle were kept in. Uh, were often below standard. Adulterated milk was often adulterated with water. Um, and if you consider that, that when the drinking water for many people was very badly contaminated anyway, um, it only went to exacerbate the problem. Milk was often taken from cattle with TB, which is you know, wouldn't be allowed, obviously, now. Filthy churns and receptacles where uh, the milk was put into to be transported as well. And very often the people milking the cows would be wearing, you know, clothes that were well past being washed. Um, so all in all, it didn't bode very well for a, a decent glass of milk. Butter was obviously, again, depending on the milk, but it was often rancid and water was added to that. Fruit and vegetables, for many, um, they were sold and again, they could be in a rotten condition. And if it was the end of the day, they often were. Other drinks such as tea and beer, use of arsenic and glucose in brewing, but when lighter beers came in, um, it was more difficult to hide the things that they put into those. 
Right, now I want to just look at the other factors. <clears throat> so if we can have slide 11. I want to look at housing, the general health of the population and diseases. And then if you can put up 12, please. There we go. Hope you can see that. That's from 1845 when um, an inquiry was done in Nottingham and it shows a very small area um, somewhere not far from um, what, what is now the Victoria Centre. Uh, and it shows you the, uh, all the houses back to back. Uh, there's um, a malt kiln in the big yellow thing. There are pigsties. There's all sorts of things in that very small area. So the working class housing was very often poor with houses built back to back in cramped areas alongside industries such as bone boiling, slaughterhouses, dairy, uh, town dairies, and pigsties. Not only did they have poor housing, they were overcrowded, families cramped together in a couple of cold, unventilated rooms. They didn't open the windows because it was too cold in winter. And things like children who con con contracted whooping cough, um, and measles spread the disease when they came in, they shut all the, the windows were all shut. So any other children in the household would automatically go down with the same um, things. The problem was as well, the uh, nutritional state of children um, was quite bad, the stamina of the child. And when they're malnu malnourished, they're less likely to be able to fight off any sort of infection. <clears throat> and often whooping cough paved the way for measles and vice versa. Sanitary conditions in housing, there was, well, basically a lack of anything. Uh, it increased the spread of diseases such as infantile diarrhea or typhoid. Um, for many, a living in these sort of back-to-backs like this one, there would be probably two or three uh, water taps, water pumps, which uh, and used by lots of people. And as you know, we know today that if there's a lot of people using a few things, then they get damaged and broken. And this is where things like the cholera outbreak of in London in 1830 came about. Privies were also in a very bad state. And that often there'd only be one in a courtyard serving several people and no one was allocated to clean it or look after it. Cooking facilities were in, from, in many of the houses. And I know we, we have this rather glamorous image of um, the range and the little chairs either side and the fire and all this sort of thing. But if you go um, to any of the sort of like back to back housing in the some in Birmingham, if you go to the museum framework knitters museum in Ruddington, which is near Nottingham, there is a house there which shows you really how they lived, um, you know, with just really an open fire. Um, as they couldn't afford fuel very often, or, or if they did, it was stolen or got from somewhere else. So they didn't have fires that often. So cooking was quite difficult. And that is why the eating of hot pies and stuff that they bought off the markets was a godsend for them. And often they used to, if they did make bread, they would take it to the baker within their area who used to do it usually on a Sunday, cook for everybody else on a Sunday. I'm gonna have slide 14, please. Oh, 
Oh, sorry. This is yeah. This one is um, shows you the back to back cows. And this was um, somebody wrote in a letter about them, and he'd drawn this, which I think is quite a shows you uh, an interesting sketch. Um, six feet. Um, wide between the two houses and 80 yards long and these were these weren't if you like the actual back-to-backs but they were very close there was no um space between any of the houses and then slide 14 yeah this one shows well supposedly cooking implements of the of the day but they were non-existent, you know, probably the only thing that would have been available for many of them would be like the toasting fork, where if they got a sausage or something like that, they could cook that on the open fire or a large sort of cauldron. Um, cooking pans and implements were very few and cleaning the same were difficult uh, because of the lack of clean running water. Uh, diseases, many of the diseases of the 19th, 20th century uh, were related to food or water, cholera, water, typhoid, water and food. Tuberculosis is made worse by malnutrition suffered by the people. Shortages of good meat, milk, those who rely on bread are prone to disease. Childhood diseases, such as infantile diarrhea, they were complicated set of circumstances which influenced this disease. Working mothers, breastfeeding or lack of, hand feeding, illegitimacy, environmental conditions, i.e. poverty and social conditions, overcrowding, waste removal and diarrhea. These were all things that impacted on small children um, in this period. Measles and whooping cough, as I've already said, um, that you don't automatically um, associate them with lack of food, but um, they are definitely connected by nutritional status. Um, and whooping cough was uh, very prevalent in the working classes in the poor areas. Um, and it had a significant um, bearing on the development of the of the disease on, on a malnourished child. A good diet and nursing care are requisites um, for a full recovery from the disease, but obviously in the conditions that many lived and with their lack of income, this was not always possible. Um, and also rickets, one of the worst um, things was rickets. Although um, in Nottingham, in the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, there weren't very many recorded cases of rickets. Now, whether this was because they didn't record it um, as it should have been recorded or it wasn't diagnosed, I don't know, but it, there weren't that many, but it, uh, According to a lot of um, studies, rickets was a, quite a, a difficult um, disease to actually get rid of. Uh, so it's obviously associated with diet, and it's particularly uh, where there's a deficiency in vitamin D, and also a lack of sunlight, which a lot of these areas would have been difficult to uh, get sunlight into because of the housing being so close together. So slide 15, please. Okay. There really in the last, well, I suppose looking at 76 now, that's getting on for sort of <clears throat> uh, 40, 50 years now, the main arguments um, on food and health have been from Thomas McEwen, uh, 
1976, who believed that the improvements in um, nutrition and therefore in um, the uh, life expectancy came about because of uh, increases in nutrition rather than improvements in public health. Whereas the other person, Simon Schreiter, in 1988 uh, tried to argue that it was public health improvements that improved the uh, expectancy of life. I've looked at those two arguments um, from a perspective of Nottingham, and certainly I favour McEwen uh, because in Nottingham, um, things began to improve by the end, very end of the 19th century, uh, health and um, life expectancy began to improve. But Nottingham was one of the worst towns, cities, um, for failing to do anything about um, its uh, health, its sanitary conditions, right? And, and it was forced in 1920 to actually do something because they wanted to extend the, the borough of Nottingham, but were refused until they actually did improve the health or the sanitary conditions of the town. Now, since doing uh, my PhD, I uh, have looked at things over the years. And in 19, uh, sorry, 2008, I came across, or I was drawn attention to, an article by Robottom and Clayton, who wrote a series of articles called An Unsuitable and Degraded Diet in which they argued that contrary to popular belief, the diet of the middle 19th century working class gave them better nutrition than many have today, and they enjoyed a better health as a result. And these findings were reported in several newspapers and magazines with the headlines such as um, in the Daily Mail, they were healthier than us and even lived longer. I think there is a slide on that one. Oh yeah, there we are. Um, Saga magazine did a healthy eating Victorian style and Spectator Life did a forget paleo, go mid Victorian. It's the healthiest diet you have never heard of. And such headlines and context mislead the reader. Um, I actually did, um, I, I did a reply to these, uh, but unfortunately, for some reason or other, the journal refused to um, take, uh, print my comments about it. Um, but like um, Iona last week, there was something that she mentioned about um, you know, giving the wrong impression about healthy diets. Where do we, how do we know whether it's a healthy diet from our perspective or from their perspective? Um, <clears throat> and from my own research, I think the two writers, Robottom and um, Clayton, they've overemphasized certain aspects and glossed over others. In fact, they said, the main elements are to be presented in an ampli and amplified in a subsequent book, which I have never seen. And as far as I know, has never been done. Uh, the talk of the working class as a homogenous group, which they certainly are not. Cookery books and dietary advice to a section of the population who were almost certainly illiterate and books would have been prohibitively expensive. And I think there's uh, another slide, Mark, showing some cookery books. Yeah, um, the domestic cookery book, bottom right, that certainly costs two shillings. And the household hints, which is the one next to it, cost a shilling. Uh, 
So as I've already outlined, the quality and quantity of food being available to them was not always possible. And if you read these books, I know um, the household hints, I think, is slightly later, 1913. It is, uh, you know, they have got, but a lot of them would have been more than um, above what the, a lot of the poor could have got. Um, bought uh, anywhere, the markets or shops. Um, also, as far as the article, the article is London-centric, so they talk really about London rather than anywhere else. Um, and they make the comment that um, life expectancy rose rapidly from the hungry 40s, while starting from such a low base, it's no wonder that any improvements would look good. So in conclusion, um, I've looked at availability, slide 18, sorry, Mark. I've looked at the type of food consumed by the poor in 19th century, 20, early 20th century. I've also examined um, the problems facing the poor in their day-to-day -day purchasing, cooking, consumption of the food. I've looked at some of the environmental conditions that were prevalent at the time and how that impacted on the health of the poor, um, not only in terms of physical um, health, but also in how they could manage to do things uh, in their home if, if at least they lived in a house, um, s some of these people lived, well, on the streets, in DOS houses, you name it. Finally, I briefly examined the historiography on food and public health conditions. So to bring this together, I'd say that the poor of the Victorian Britain, the choices were limited. They were entrapped in environmental surroundings which were not conducive to a healthy life and it was not until both of these subjects were adequately addressed and some would argue this still has not happened by successive governments that improvements were made and it could be argued that even now there is still a visible proportion of the, the population who are inadequately fed and live on substandard live in substandard homes which the present pandemic has highlighted Thank you very much. Okay, Mark.